Taking a live look at Hurricane Adalia as it charges, charges rather towards Florida's Big Bend region, forcing hundreds of evacuations. Vic Michalucci with our sister station WJXT in Jacksonville, Florida, is in Dixie County tracking the latest. We are in Dixie County in Florida's Big Bend region where the hurricane is coming through right now. The eyewall of Edalia is coming into this particular area as we speak. We're getting some very strong gusts, some moments when we've got some heavy rain, and then you have a little bit of a lull. But if you look all around me, you will see that there is debris, palm fronds, branches, all kinds of leaves, all kinds of things that have come down. And in the distance, a couple palm trees have come down, a couple on fences as well. Power is out here. It's been out for quite some time on the other side. And I do want to give you some perspective. So you're going to hear some names about where this storm is particularly making landfall along the Gulf Coast. Steenhatchee, that's about 10 miles west of where we are standing right there. And then you also have Cedar Key, which is about 45 minutes south of us. Certainly they are dealing with significant storm surge right now. At last check, it was around seven feet, but the tide is coming in. So you're going to see flooding there. You're going to see damage there. Horseshoe Beach also off this way. Keaton Beach, other places that are right around the coast, they are low lying. And I've been saying this, the silver lining here is this is a part of Florida where there are not a lot of residents. So you've got small towns, people who are tough, they're used to storms coming through. They're pretty much prepared. The bad news is a majority of the people live in homes in low lying areas and a significant number of people here live in mobile homes, prefabricated manufactured homes, which obviously are very dangerous during hurricanes and for those potential spinoffs from tornadoes. So certainly <coughs> we are worried about them. There's at least one shelter open here and several of the motels have also opened their doors to not only families, but their pets. There's about 250 National Guard members staged here in this county and they have the heavy machinery the high water trucks as well as Humvees to go out there and do any rescues if needed. But right now, everyone is trying to stay inside and ride out the rest of this storm. For now, in Dixie County in Florida's Big Bend, I'm Vic Michalucci. Back to you. All right, Vic, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. It's Wednesday, August 30th. Thanks for joining us today uh, here at home. Not too bad. We started off kind of cool in the 70s, so not that bad. No complaints for me. Not at all. Very comfortable outside. Here's mm -hmm. Justin Horn. Yeah, very comfortable start here. Of course, you just saw what Vic was reporting on there in Florida. Hurricane Adelia making landfall uh, about an hour or so ago, and it is moving quick. It's almost into the state of Georgia now. You see the, the eye wall there moving just to the east of Tallahassee. It's uh, moving quickly to the north and northeast, but bringing rain bands around through Florida as it does. Here is the latest on Adalia. It is a Category 2 hurricane now. Winds are at 105 miles per hour, gusting to 160, uh, moving north-northeast at about 18 miles per hour. I think those gusts are actually a little bit high, probably a little bit lower than that. But th that's the latest update. And as it moves off to the north-northeast, uh, it uh, continues to be a Category 2 storm, still probably packing winds of about 100 miles per hour through the lunch hour, but it starts to weaken as it works its way up towards Charleston, South Carolina, probably a tropical storm at this point, and that's by overnight tonight into early tomorrow morning. Meantime, here's a look at the latest gusts that we're seeing as recorded by some of the sites there. 54 miles per hour in Perry, seeing gusts to 67 miles per hour up there around Valdosta. So uh, the winds are really starting to pick up, and uh, as you just saw, there's going to be some damage as far as trees being down and things like that. Okay, now let's talk our neck of the woods, and we've got good news this morning. Down to 72 here in San Antonio. There were 60s in the hill country. What a great start. Low humidity allowed for some cooler temperatures. That is the coolest low here in San Antonio since June 9th. you got to go back 82 days ago since we've been this cool. Pretty incredible. Nice start, but we will see some clouds as we head into the afternoon. Temperatures still make their way up around 100 degrees and a 20% chance of a shower to uh, later today. Don't get your hopes up, though. Anything we see today is going to be light and few and far between. And the extended forecast has a lot of triple digits still. Uh, we're going to talk more about that coming up here in just a few minutes, guys.
Thank you, Justin. Looking out there with TransGuide. Uh, here at I-10 at the Y, things look pretty good. Uh, we do have a reported accident on 281 at St. Mary's. So this might be some of that scene right there. You can see them cleaning up. We have stalled vehicles in some of our camera shots, but otherwise things are moving. 281 was northbound at St. Mary's, and that was definitely the scene. Here is a look at today's 9 at 9. We're keeping a close eye on Hurricane Idalia. It may landfall just before 7 a.m. with winds of over 120 miles per hour. The National Hurricane Center warns of potentially life-threatening storm surge of up to 16 feet. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis has issued an emergency declaration for 49 of the state's 67 counties. 5,500 National Guardsmen have been deployed to help as the storm moves inland and the damage is assessed. Ten people have been arrested in the kidnapping and murder of 34-year-old Thomas Rath, who was last seen alive in late May in New York. His remains were found in a shallow grave on August 3rd. Investigators believe Rath knew his attackers. Two suspects face second-degree murder charges and nine face kidnapping charges. Investigators say more people will likely be arrested in the case. Almost a dozen people were hospitalized Tuesday after experiencing severe turbulence on a Delta Airlines flight to Atlanta. The FAA says the plane was roughly 40 miles from Hartsfield-Jackson International Airport when the turbulence began. Delta thanked first responders who assisted once the plane landed safely, saying, our priority is taking care of our customers and crew who sustained injuries. RSV, flu, and COVID-19 are expected to circulate over the next few months. An updated COVID vaccine is expected next month. And shots for the flu and RSV are already available. CDC says in addition to getting vaccinated, people should also try early testing, improving ventilation systems, and in some cases, mask wearing. The Biden administration has unveiled its list of the first 10 drugs Medicare will negotiate prices on. It includes blood thinners and medications that treat conditions like diabetes, cancer, and heart disease. Negotiated pricing won't take effect until 2026. The pharmaceutical industry has filed multiple lawsuits seeking to derail Medicare's new negotiating authority. None have succeeded as of now. The EPA and U.S. Army has slashed federally protected water by more than half. A new rule will invalidate an earlier definition of what constitutes the waters of the United States. That's after the Supreme Court ruled Clean Water Act protections extend only to wetlands with a continuous service connection to bodies that are waters of the United States in their own rights. The rule goes into effect immediately. U.S. financial regulators signed off on new rules to prepare large and regional banks for possible failure. It comes in the wake of three bank failures earlier this year. One rule requires banks with at least $100 billion in assets to issue another $70 billion in new long-term debt. Another draft rule would force banks to disclose more details on how they would be safely managed if they were to fail. The rules still need to be finalized after industry feedback. Walmart may be looking to cut costs by cutting back on pharmacists across the country. Reuters says that the company is asking some of its 16,000 pharmacists to voluntarily take pay cuts by reducing their hours. Walmart is also reportedly looking to hire new pharmacists at lower base salaries. Talk show hosts Stephen Colbert, Jimmy Fallon, Jimmy Kimmel, Seth Meyers, and John Oliver are joining forces for a new limited podcast titled Strike Force 5. The podcast will have at least 12 episodes, and each host will serve as a rotating moderator discussing the complexities behind the continuing Hollywood strikes. Proceeds generated from the podcast will go to out-of-work staff from all the hosts' late-night shows. It launches today and will be available on most major podcast platforms. And that's today's night at nine. Any morning headlines, according to researchers, we could be losing some of the world's penguin population and a worm on the brain. An unusual farm rescue and subway going airborne. Our David Sears is here with all of your morning headlines. The skies are getting crowded with blimps. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have that for you in just a second, but first, hang on to your tuxedos. There's some concern over the penguin population on Antarctica. Looks pretty chill up there, however... Some researchers say the sea ice is disappearing and that's threatening the number of penguin colonies. 
According to the recent report in the journal Nature Communications Earth and Environment, some researchers say that it was likely five emperor penguin colonies didn't have any chicks that survived last year. They say it's because mama depends on stable sea ice that is attached to land in order to nest and raise the little ones, and the sea ice broke off the land earlier than usual. They say it likely contributed to the chicks drowning or drifting away from the adults. The author of the article claims that if the trend continues, 90% of the emperor penguin colonies will be, quote, quasi-extinct by 2100. If you're eating or even if you're not, hold up a second because this one might gross you out just a bit. Let's take you to Australia. Doctors pulled a live worm <laughs> from a woman's brain. Yep, a three-inch long live worm. The woman's 64. She underwent brain surgery for an abnormality in the right frontal lobe of her brain. Yeah, I guess so. The worm was confirmed a parasite usually found in pythons. The woman lived near a lake area inhabited by carpet pythons. Doctors think she got the worm after looking for a native leafy vegetable. She cooked it and then ate it. Infectious disease experts say it's the first case to involve the brain of any of this type of species. All right, we love rescue stories, and this is a one-of-a-kind meet Billy Potter. He is from Virginia. He has some land and some donkeys, and one day he came across a young donkey right there in the middle of the road. She was all excited. When he got out of the truck, he found out why she was all excited, because he looked down the hill, and there was Mama laying in a muddy pond. Bill trying to figure out what to do, so he started making calls. Finally, fire and rescue showed up. They got out all their gear, pulleys and backboards, and when they got down to the donkey, they realized she was pregnant. So that added to the stress of saving the animal, but they got it done. At the end of the day, um, Emma was pregnant as well. We had to, had to worry about two lives there instead of one, um, and it made the, made the rescue a little tricky. We actually pulled the donkey out the pond, and she stood up and actually took off, which that was a great relief in his eyes and ours as well. Having that feeling when she stood up and took off, it was just amazing. I was like, that's going to stick with me for the rest of my life. I got other donkeys, but this one right here has got a special place in my heart. Thank you. There's no words that will take the place of what they did. Kind of like you know, some people's got dogs and I got donkeys. That donkey is like my kid. Billy and the firefighter and all those rescuers have a great story to tell. All right, and finally, you can take the subway to the air and enjoy a sandwich all along the way. Check that out. That is the new subway blimp. It'll be cruising to several cities next month. And yes, I actually have room for six and some sandwiches. The first cities for the sub blimp, Kansas City, Atlanta, Orlando, and Miami. I think got to get in some contest or something to see if you can get a ride on the sub and get a sandwich. Did you hear what they were calling this thing, the nickname? You know, there's the band Led Zeppelin. Yeah. This is Bread Zeppelin. Bread Zeppelin. <laughs> well, and then they're in their blimpy subs. There yeah. is. That's yeah. competition. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. wonder if Blimpy has a blimp. Yeah. How much did the wrap cost on that blimp? Look at that giant thing. Uh, yeah, that's crazy. a lot. Uh, it's a rather large yeah. sandwich. Is very, that a, very detailed. Is that a foot long? <laughs> <laughs> that's a little bit bigger. All right. David, thank you, yep. sir. Right now, 9, 11, 81 degrees. Still ahead on GMSA at 9. Google is testing out artificial intelligence. We're going to tell you where you can try it yourself. Still ahead, pause for, oh, we're going to have Tiffany. The city of San Antonio is focusing on the importance of nutritious eating for families and children. We explore easy, healthy recipes that taste delicious and what resources are in our community for free. Coming up next. August is Kids Eat Right Month, and we are exploring healthy recipes and what resources are available in San Antonio for families. Tiffany Huertas joins us live from the Buena Vista WIC Clinic with a few ideas of where you can learn more about healthy eating and active lifestyles. Hey, Tiffany. Hey, good morning. Metro Health WIC program does about two to three times a month different food demos for the communities and just check it out. These are some of the items that they get and they share with the community and some healthy food options right here this morning. We have Mayra Porres, a WIC dietitian, to talk a little bit more about Kids Eat Right Month and the importance behind it. Good morning. Hi, good morning, Tiffany. Tell me a little bit more about what this month is all about. Yes, so for Kids Eat Right Month, it was established in 2014 and it's a celebration of uh, 
um, eating right, teaching our family, our communities um, a healthy he to make healthy um, choices and promote physical activity and just healthy lifestyle changes. Tell me about what we're seeing here on the plate. Yes, so here I prepared um, two little recipes that are quick and easy for our families and geared towards children. Um, so here we have a smoothie. Um, if your kids are picky eaters, this smoothie has a handful of spinach to kind of get those veggies in there. Um, and then it also has uh, frozen blueberries and 100% fruit juice. All these items you can buy with our WIC, um, with our WIC uh, foods. And right here, we have some really cute faces, sandwiches here. <laughs> yes, yeah, so these little toasts, they have um, their whole grains. So here at WIC, we do promote more of the whole grain items. Um, so it is recommended to eat half your plate fruits and veggies, half gr uh, whole grain, and half those whole grain, um, those grains to be whole grain. So here is the whole grain bread. Um, we have some peanut butter spread on it, and then we also have um, the Philadelphia cream cheese. Both of those have protein. So so that's good. And then we topped it with some fruits and veggies. And also we have some really interesting plates here. Tell us about these. Yes. Yeah, so this is kind of what I was alluding, uh, um, alluding to. So half your plate should be fruits and vegetables. The other plate, the other half should be grains and protein and half the grains, whole grain, and then your dairy products. What are we seeing here in San Antonio? When you talk to families in the community, what do they tell you about trying to eat healthy or different options in the community? Yes. Yeah, so everyone's kind of, you know, wanting that general education like what's the key to live a healthier lifestyle, um, how to stay more active, uh, what food swaps can we do. So we have dietitians like myself here at WIC, and we also have our nutritionists at the clinic who provide our families with some of that nutrition education, how to make those um, food swaps, how to grocery shop, read the nutrition labels, things of that sort. So many different resources. Now, tonight, there's an event happening. Tell me about that. Uh, yes, yeah, so tonight, there'll be an event at Popoli's Greek Grill, um, and our Pura Vida um, team will be there, and they'll have specials for the children, since it's Kids Eat Right Month. Um, they'll have some specials on their kids' menu. Awesome. Well, I'm excited to learn a little bit more about the different resources. Thanks for joining us. Yes, of course. We're going to tell you a little bit more about that coming up on the noon show. We'll send it back to you for now. Sounds good. Great ideas. Thank you, Tiffany. Well, 81 degrees outside, it feels even better than that for now. Yeah, uh, it will get hot again later today. Not quite out of the woods yet as we get close to wrapping up the month of August. I yeah. wish I had good news as we go into September <laughs> that it was going to get cooler, but it, it just really doesn't. We've got a lot of triple digits in the forecast. And yeah, today I think we're right back there at 100, but it's a dry heat after yeah. uh, we had some little humidity this morning, which allowed for a nice start. Uh, let's uh, take a look at the numbers. 62 now days at which we were at 100 or above yesterday we did get to 100 briefly but we got there and so now we're just uh, padding our stats as we've been saying uh, it's entirely possible that we get into the upper 60s here uh, it's going to be a record that's going to be hard to beat in the future uh, because it just feels like each and every day this summer we've been at 100 or above and honestly it uh, it's been a high percentage of days at that number 2.02 .02 since June 1st, so we're about five inches, more than five inches below average when you look at just the summer numbers, and then you look at the yearly total, 13.86 inches of rain, we're nearly seven inches below average. Not as bad as last year, but pretty close. So two summers in a row, two years in a row in which we have not had good rainfall, we're hoping the fall is more fruitful and that we get some showers and storms. It's just not in the forecast yet. As we go outside for you, yeah, it's been a great morning. 81 degrees right now. We're starting to see temperatures warm up. There is a little bit of a heat index, but not much. New Braunfels 83, Seguin 81, Bernie and Kerrville, which started off in the 60s this morning, now in the mid to upper 70s. Air quality today, uh, not as great as it could be. Uh, there's going to be some uh, elevated levels of ozone. So for those who are sensitive to that kind of thing, we're in that unhealthy for sensitive folks category uh, just to let you know what about rainfall we don't expect a lot but i do think we could see a couple of showers this afternoon the computer models continue to show that it's pretty dry at the surface so anything that develops it's not going to be very heavy and there'll be few and far between but there is a 10 to 20 percent chance of seeing a shower later today otherwise it's just going to be partly cloudy and yes hot the dew point trend so right now we're already not all that humid, but by the afternoon we'll see dew points in the mid 50s, which is fairly dry, comfortable, 
and that's uh, that's what we'll be dealing with into the afternoon hours. Uh, so yes, a dry heat. 92 at 11 o'clock, 94 noon time. 98 by 2 p.m. 100 at 4 o'clock with a 10 to 20 percent chance of rain. And we'll keep that through 7 o'clock. So that window for going to see any showers is basically 3 to 7 uh, today uh, with that northerly wind 515. Now as hot as it's going to be, it is another CPS Energy yellow day. They're asking for voluntary conservation between 3 and 9 p.m. We've been here a lot this summer, so we know what to do. But uh, here's some more information if you need it. If you want more information, you can scan that QR code. Okay, let's talk about Adalia. And as I said off the top of the show, she's already starting to move into Georgia. So this hurricane is booking it across the state of Florida. And uh, it did bring some damage there with some very gusty winds and some pretty significant storm surge there around Cedar Key. Uh, the eye wall starting to move into the state of Georgia now. And you're getting some heavy rain and some very strong winds around Tallahassee as well. Still Category 2 hurricane. Winds are at 105 miles per hour and it's moving north northeast at 18 stays a category two storm through about lunchtime and then it'll begin the weekend as it moves up towards South Carolina. And by 1 a.m. tomorrow morning, uh, this is a tropical storm there over Charleston, South Carolina, before it moves out into the Atlantic and we can say goodbye to Adalia. But right now the winds gusting to 45 there in Perry, gusting to 67 in Valdosta and gusting to 48 in Lake City. So some pretty strong winds, still some very heavy rain and of course still some storm surge going on on the west coast of Florida. Extended forecast 102 Thursday, 101 Friday. I don't need to finish this. Uh, I think you know where this is going. Triple digits every day. There could be some small chances Monday and Tuesday on the coast for some showers, but we are stuck back in this forecast again. It is going to change. I, once we get in September, fronts will start to come through, and that should, you know, that would be bring great. about some better, better days. Yeah, kind of like this morning. This morning was nice if it could this just stay that nice. way. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Thanks, Justin. Mm -hmm. 922, 83 degrees. Inflation is hitting the diaper aisle pretty hard. After the break, we're going to tell you which diapers are worth spending so much of that cash on. It's double the diaper duty. Alex Flowers twins went through nearly 6,000 disposables before their first birthday. It was a relief for us financially when our kids were able to potty train and we didn't have to buy diapers anymore. Babies and toddlers use a lot of diapers and costs add up. So Consumer Reports tested 10 popular brands ranging in price from 11 cents to 51 cents a diaper. The testing mimicked what babies do a lot. We looked at how fast the diaper absorbs saline and how well it holds it in, helping keep your baby dry. Luxury brand Coterie came out on top, acing the absorption and dryness tests. They're also the most expensive tested at 51 cents each. Seventh generation, another diaper that claims to be environmentally friendly, also scored near the top. They're also pricey at 35 cents each. The good news? There are more budget-friendly alternatives that scored well, too. Consumer Reports says Amazon's Mama Bear and Walmart's Parents Choice are good options for well under 20 cents a diaper. They also recommend well-known brands like Huggies, Pampers, Loves, and Kirkland. All of those landed in the middle of the ratings. At the bottom, diaper and honest company diapers. Although they did okay in the dryness test, that wasn't the case for the absorption test, meaning a bigger risk of leaks. And that's something no parent wants, especially if it's times two. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. 927, 83 degrees. There's more ahead on TMSA at 9. And when it comes to getting older, aging is also part of that process. Coming up, we're going to talk to Consumer Reports health writer Kevin Loria about anti-aging remedies and what you should avoid. Well, we've been keeping a close eye all morning long on Hurricane Adalia. Here is a live look from WCJB. Heavy rain in the area. We've seen some storm surge in this shot for hours now in Steinhatchee, Florida. And one of the people tracking it is meteorologist Justin Horn. Yeah, and I think one of the main issues you see there with the live cam is that uh, there has been pretty good storm surge. So there's inundation here along the coast. That's going to be the issue. I think that's going to be most pressing, but also with those gusty winds and there's a lot of trees in that area, power lines coming down, they're probably going to be without power for a while as this storm system is very quickly making its way off to the north and east. We're going to have an update on Adalia coming up here in about uh, 15 minutes or so, but we start with our forecast for today around 100 
uh, that's going to be our high, but it will feel like 99. Why is that? Because the air will be so dry. We're not expecting a lot of humidity humidity today. In fact, humidity has already dropped off this morning and will drop off even more later today. So it will be just a dry heat, still hot though. And the pollen count came in this morning. Molds are dropping. They're in a the moderate, moderate category at 880, but interestingly enough, fall elm shows up for the first time this season. A sign that fall is around the corner, we hope, uh, when it comes to these uh, temperatures. Noontime, 94. We're up around 98 by 2 p.m. 100 again is our high. There is a 20% chance of a stray shower uh, between 3 and 7 p.m., but uh, don't get your hopes up too much. Anything we see is going to be very, very light. Again, we've got an update on Adalia coming up as uh, she moves into the state of Georgia. We're also going to check in on the lake levels here in just a few minutes, guys. Thank you, Justin. It appears to be a stall off of I-10 at the Y, but now we're looking at I-35 at Topper Line, where things are moving just fine at this hour. It looked like the incident earlier on 281 uh, heading out of downtown was in the clearing stages. I'm not seeing that camera right now. If we see it, we'll pop it back up. Well, how far does your homeowners association's power extend? One Northside HOA told its members that we begin towing cars parked on a public street. Garrett Berringer looked into whether that is something they could actually do. The roads in and out of the Westfield neighborhood off of Prue Road are open and ungated, but its homeowners association recently tried to tell residents they're not open to parking. Parking in the street is prohibited and all vehicles parked in the street are subject to and will be towed away. Kevin Sloan says he and his neighbors got these letters a few weeks ago. Warning enforcement would start September 1st. It was very surprising to, to see that, that they want to tow from a public street. Um, surprised me, surprised my neighbors, surprised my other neighbor. I mean, it surprised a bunch of us. That's my niece's car. That's Monica Garcia says it's not feasible given the amount of cars they have among their various family members. Our kids have cars, we have cars. It's kind of hard to keep two or even four cars in here without blocking, you know, the sidewalk and stuff. Neither homeowner knew of anyone who thought it was a good idea. Everyone's pissed. Everyone's angry. The goal was not to try to do something to piss everybody off. Instead, the HOA's president-elect says it was about safety. Because when it comes to an emergency situation, time is life. The city attorney's office told us in an emailed statement that it was unfamiliar with the HOA's rules, but also that the streets are public right-of-ways and parking is permitted. Baff says the HOA is backing off the idea, both because of issues with the streets being public and also that towing actually would not be enforceable under the HOA's rules. But they plan to present residents with options for moving forward, including whether to try to privatize their streets. Because, he says, the parking on the street is a concern for some. We are only going to enforce what the residents want, and that's the best we can do. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. One other news, getting older is just a part of life, and you've probably heard the same advice for the best chance to live a long, healthy life. Exercise, eat well, and get enough sleep. There are also certain harmful behaviors that you should avoid because they increase risk for disease and premature aging. So joining us this morning is Consumer Reports health writer Kevin Loria to talk more about this. Good morning, Kevin. Hi, good morning. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Kevin. When we think about aging well, how much have we learned about living longer, particularly in terms of preventing chronic diseases? Sure. So people now live a lot longer than they used to. Uh, even though COVID caused a dip in life expectancy, people in the U.S. are expected to live about 26 years longer than they did in the 1950s. So we're learning a lot about what it takes to thrive during those years. Now, that said, age is still kind of the number one risk factor for a number of chronic diseases, including various cancers, heart disease, and neurodegeneration. But we're still learning what it takes to stave off those illnesses. And sometimes we know it's, you know, stay away from candy, but what are some things we should avoid putting into our bodies as we continue to age? Right. So there are certain things that we can put into our bodies or behaviors that we really want to avoid because they have negative impacts on our bodies as we age, on systems throughout our bodies, and can even cause us to show signs of age factor. So smoking is a big one of these. Smoking can greatly increase risk for a number of diseases and affect the aging process in a really negative way. 
Alcohol consumption is another one of these things that has a negative impact on the aging process, especially as the quantity of alcohol consumed rises. And eating highly processed foods, so whether that's candy or something else, you know, a lot of highly processed foods can negatively impact our aging process and chronic disease risk. So these are all things that we kind of want to steer clear of as much as we can. And we all know sleep and exercise are super important to our overall health, but obviously that's going to change as we get older, right, Kevin? Well, you know, you would think so, but these are still really important. You know, the, the anti-aging intervention that we would have the probably the best evidence for is very likely exercise. There's little that you can do to kind of help you age well and live long than to kind of focus on exercise. And so the reverse of that is also true. You know, sedentary behavior has a really negative impact. So you really want to make sure to stay active. And sleep is really important too, because it affects systems throughout our bodies, you know, our brain, our cardiovascular system, you know, all kinds of things. And so it is very true that sleep needs and patterns change with age, but people should definitely discuss poor sleep with their doctor. And what about meds that have anti-aging claims? Could those provide benefits or help slow down the aging process? Right. So it's true that you see a lot of products out there, especially supplements that are marketed as having anti-aging properties. They'll say things like they protect cognition or support brain health. And unfortunately, there's just not a lot of good evidence supporting the use of the vast majority of, product, of these sorts of products. Now, that said, doctors are researching uh, molecules and drugs that really could have a positive impact on the aging process. So these include the molecule rapamycin, which is given to certain organ transplant recipients and the diabetes drug metformin, you know, it's possible that these could help the aging process in certain ways. But for now, at least, we don't know how to best make use of these substances and of who they are going to be most safe for, when they should be given, and how to avoid any negative side effects. So while this is an interesting area of research, we're just not there yet on kind of anti-aging pills. All right, Kevin, I'm sorry, buddy. I'm ready for a Snickers and a nap, but that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Kevin Laurie. Fair enough. Yeah, all right. Kevin Laurie from Consumer Reports, thank you so much for your time and your expertise. Thank you so much. Take care. Right now we're at 938, 84 degrees. You're watching GMSA at 9. Still ahead, if you've ever picked up your phone and it's steaming hot, it's not due to the sun. We're going to tell you some tips to prevent your phone from overheating. And let's look out there with Zoo Cam at the San Antonio Zoo. Our flamingos are enjoying the cooler morning that we had, but of course things are heating up. We see one one there in the shade, kind of up front, saying hello to us this it's Wednesday morning. A perfect day to go to the zoo, especially right about now. We see water there, but mm -hmm. of course water is a uh, commodity hard to come by around here in South Texas. Yeah, we were just looking at some of the rivers. The rivers aren't doing so well. That's been the case for most of the summer, and the reservoir levels have been bad most of the summer, but we're starting to hit some lows here. Canyon Lake notably uh, now at a record low, down to, uh, 16 feet to 68%. Amistad, 36%. We know Medina has just been in bad shape for about two years now. 4.4% uh, down 86 feet. It can't really go much further. Choke Canyon, 28% down 26 feet. I know it's kind of the same numbers over and over again, but we want to keep delivering these to you and let you know that, uh, yeah, they've, they've slid even more. We, we could use some rain in the worst way. And as we look at the potential rainfall over the next seven days, not much there. Not much there. We've got some monsoonal rains out west. You got some rains across the southeast. Obviously, Florida's getting a ton of rain today. It's just not happening for us. But as I said, as we get into September, our odds of seeing a front, a front increase significantly. And once we get a front, we often stir up some rain. So there is hope. Uh, it's just not over the next seven days. Uh, is it's going to stay fairly dry. Now, the other issue we have today, relative humidity is going to fall off uh, into uh, we're around 20% or so, I think, by the afternoon. That puts us pretty close to that fire danger territory. Winds aren't going to be terribly strong, but things are just so very dry that there is a pretty significant fire threat from San Antonio points north and points east. That's where you have a very high risk of wildfires today. We can't let our guard down there either. I know we haven't uh, seen much lately because we've had a couple bouts of rain, but know that today is one of those days where the if a fire gets started, it can spread pretty quickly. Let's look at the forecast as far as rain goes. Could we see any relief today? As we said, there is a very small chance of a shower this afternoon. It's just not going to amount to much, and the models have backed off of this quite a bit. I'm going to show you the water vapor here in a second, and you'll see why 
there's not a, a really a, a great risk of showers today because there's just so much dry air in place. Uh, but we can't rule it out, so there's about a 20% chance of seeing a light shower this afternoon. Otherwise, we're starting to warm up. 81 right now, north northwesterly winds at about 6 miles per hour. And the forecast today calls for a high right around 100. You'll see some higher numbers uh, to the east, 102 Forestville, 100 in Gonzales, 98 in Uvalde, 95. The forecast in Lakey today. And here's that water vapor I was talking about, this orange color. So what water vapor does, by the way, is it shows the, the moisture content in the atmosphere. But where you get this orange and yellow color, that represents some really dry air, and we have that over top of us. There is a little disturbance working north to south towards us, but with so much dry air, it's going to be hard to really get a lot of shower activity going today. Then as you look east, a lot of tropical moisture here with Adalia. And uh, here's the latest. It is uh, moving through Florida now, moving into Georgia. Valdosta getting hit pretty hard at this shower. And there is a tornado watch box ahead of this because a lot of times with these tropical systems as they spin, they can spin up little tornadoes, especially on the east side of these systems. So that's a possibility today. Jacksonville up to Savannah, Georgia, as this thing is racing now and uh, will be near Savannah a little bit later today. Uh, it is weakening, though. Winds at 105 miles per hour. Still some heavy rain associated with it. 102 Thursday, 101 Friday will be in the triple digits this weekend. Labor Day will also be hot, around 100. And so will Tuesday next week. Uh, so we just keep the streak of 100 degrees going uh, through the weekend. Overnight lows, though, pretty comfortable still. Like this morning, we'll get the numbers down into the low 70s. Guys. Thank you, Justin. And with these hot temperatures, the sun isn't always the cause of an overheating foam, but it can still do a number on our electronic devices. Here's ABC's Melissa Don with some tips to prevent your phone from overheating. When your phone overheats, it can slow down or even shut off completely. In extreme cases, there could be damage to parts of your phone like the battery or the SIM card. CNET Trends reporter Abrar Alhiti says there are multiple reasons why your phone might get hot. A major culprit is the sun. The most important thing to do to prevent your phone from overheating is really keeping it from direct sunlight. So keeping it in a, a pocket or in the shade is a really good idea. Alhiti says to try not to leave your phone in a hot environment for an extended period of time, even if it's not in direct sunlight. Think of leaving it in your car while you go to run an errand. It's probably a good idea to, to bring it down with you. Avoid using graphics or processor intensive apps while charging your device, such as mobile video games. Another thing is avoiding streaming when you're charging your phone. Just let it charge first and then you can get back to Hulu and Netflix after that. Steer clear of third party charging cables. So don't use a faulty third party charger that you got for $2 off some random site on the internet. Use a good charger from a reputable brand. And software bugs can cause overheating too. So always update your system software and apps to the latest version. Melissa Don, ABC News, Los Angeles. Google is bringing its Duet AI Assistant to all of its workspace apps. The company says more than one million people have already tested the technology. Google is charging large corporations $30 per user for that access. That's the same price as Microsoft's AI Assistant. And the time now is 948 and 85 degrees for now. Be right back. Nine fifty one. a message to parents from pediatricians across the country. Talk to your doctor about the pneumococcal vaccine, especially if your child is under the age of two. A local hospitalist tells our Courtney Friedman that serious illnesses can be avoided just by getting that vaccine. Pneumococcus is a bacteria that some people carry even without symptoms, and it can be spread by coughing or sneezing. It's dangerous for children under two because of their undeveloped immune systems. While it can cause minor issues like ear infections, it can also turn into something serious. So they can develop severe pneumonias, meningitis, bone and joint infections, as well as blood infections with pneumococcus. Dr. Mandy tibbles Vatek is a pediatric hospitalist with University Hospital and UT Health San Antonio and says that's why prevention is key in the form of a vaccine. It is. 
you know, part of the routine vaccine schedule that they get up to four doses prior to the age of 15 months. During the height of the pandemic, a lot of kids didn't make it to their normal doctor's appointments, so they ended up places like this, University Hospital, dealing with severe symptoms. The Texas Medical Association reports there are nearly 2,000 invasive pneumococcal disease cases in Texas every year. In the hospital, we see it enough with pneumonias, overcoming ear infections that go beyond, and then sometimes we'll see in small infants it, that that it gets into their blood stream. So talk to your pediatrician if you see long lasting infections or fever, especially if your child is in school, daycare or other crowded spaces. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. And a big congratulations to a local school aide with Comal ISD, Mary Gomez, our Miss Mary, was surprised with the district's 590 award for customer service. Comal ISD is honoring her for going above and beyond as an after school aide for 20 years. Congratulations, Ms. Mary, and thank you all for so much. Thank you, rather, for what you do. Another look at the Rose with Transguy looking over at the camera here at Loop 410 at Rolling Ridge. We have a slowdown. We do. We have an accident, but it's only blocking the shoulder right now. No main lanes are blocked. We also have an accident working 410 at Evers, and that is in the eastbound lane. Stalled vehicles in a couple different spots around the town, but they do not appear to be causing major problems. And let's look out there with live cam. The sun is out, but it's been a nice morning so far, so we'll take that, definitely. I mean, for just 86 degrees, not too bad. We can handle that. Mm -hmm. Well, the comparison, of course, is to uh, Florida and what they've been dealing with, and that is a very fast-moving hurricane. We've been watching Hurricane Idalia all morning long. Here's a live look as it continues to move uh, into the southeast United States. And Justin's here at the desk with us to get us updated on, on what a fast mover Idalia truly is. Yeah, it's moving really quickly, so you don't have to worry about freshwater rainfall flooding. What you worry about is the storm surge, and that's kind of what we've been uh, dealing with. This uh, picture here kind of shows you those, those big waves. So there still is some storm surge going on there on the west coast of Florida, but it is moving up into Georgia and weakening Idalia as uh, she moves north, northeast. And so it'll affect uh, the east coast of Georgia, places like Savannah and Charleston, South Carolina, a little bit later today. But this is what you're seeing here. This is, a, I think, a direct result of some of that storm surge, some of the flooding that uh, they're, they're going to see. And not only that, there's a ton of trees in this area. So those trees come down when you get the gusty winds. Uh, it causes power outages, and those, those are probably going to be some of the bigger issues they deal with. That's another reporter's live shot there. You can see them standing just off of camera. Yeah. Uh, Dahlia now going to be moving out to sea pretty quickly, right? Yeah, it should. Uh, yeah, you see the satellite picture there. It's, uh, it's going to make its way up to Savannah tonight and should be out in the open Atlantic uh, by tomorrow morning. Then the question a lot of people are asking, well, does it redevelop? It doesn't look that way. Mm -hmm. uh, it kind of okay. falls apart and uh, probably moves into a less conducive atmosphere for any kind of strengthening or anything like that. So a uh, very fast moving hurricane, uh, but it did take a track that you haven't seen since the 1800s. I'm sure you've heard that mentioned. The good news here, if there is any, is that that's a rather unpopulated area, part of Florida, where uh, it's mostly just kind of uh, trees and forests and not necessarily a lot of uh, a lot of people. Let's we'll see how it goes for Georgia and uh, South Carolina for the rest of today and into tonight. Yeah, it, uh, it probably will get some gusty winds, some rain with it, but hopefully uh, she continues to weaken a little bit. I want to show our seven day forecast to here real quick uh, before we go. And uh, again, we have a small chance for shower today, but really it's it's just going to be hot 100. Uh, low humidity like we're seeing this morning and there's some nice mornings ahead but uh, we've got triple digits unfortunately across the board and if you're planning out Labor Day it looks dry and hot. All right we'll focus on the early mornings then. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks Justin. Thank you for joining us today. Have a great day.